Hi, my name is Fernando Rosa Planella and I'm a research fellow at the University of Warwick. Today I want to talk about some work we're currently doing on revisiting the models for the galvanostatic intermittent titration technique in order to estimate the lithium uh, diffusivity. So the motivation of this work is that nowadays we're using more and more physics-based models because they offer us a lot of insight on, on the battery. But at the same time, they need a lot of parameters. And actually estimating these parameters correctly uh, for the battery we are interested in uh, is one of the challenges uh, in order for these models to, to spread, uh, spread widely. And uh, amongst all the parameters, lithium diffusivity plays a very important role in the behavior of the battery. So getting good estimates of it uh, is crucial to get good predictions. One of the most common ways to estimate the diffusivity of intercalated lithium is using this GITT or galvanostatic intermittent titration technique, which consists on applying a, a constant current pulse to the battery and then switching it off and letting it, letting the battery reach equilibrium again. And this pulse needs to be short and weak, so it causes small variation in the uh, uh, in the concentration or in the state of charge of the battery. So we need to repeat it many many times to sweep the whole uh, range of operation that we are interested in. And in terms of the voltage response you observe, well, there is some ohmic part. Uh, it's not actually quite ohmic. There might be some very, very quick transients, but we assume here it's, it's purely ohmic. And then some diffusive part. And this diffusive is caused by uh, the change in, in, in the potential or in the open circuit potential caused by the, the diffusion uh, of uh, lithium inside of the particles. And that's what's going to give us information to to obtain the diffusion coefficient. And because we are measuring voltage, but we care about diffusivity, what we need to do is fit a model to this data. And that's always the case. In some cases, it's not obvious because we're doing this implicitly, but there is always a model behind that. And with a the model, there are some assumptions that we need to be fully aware of. Because what will happen often is that uh, the model we use to run the simulation is not the same we use to fit uh, the parameters. And that's fine, but they need to be consistent. So we need to ensure that the model we use to fit the parameters from experimental data is consistent with the model we're going to run the simulations with, because otherwise the results we're going to get uh, will, will make no sense. So what we do here is start with the DFN model, the Dole Newman model for a health cell, that is a cell with um, a lithium counter electrode, and use this technique called asymptotic technique uh, to simplify that model uh, based on a set of assumptions. That Those asymptotic techniques are a mathematical uh, method that uh, it's pretty standard. I won't go into detail into it, but basically the idea is that we take some assumptions on certain dimensionless groupings uh, of parameters in the model, and then that help us get rid uh, of any effects that are negligible um, in, our, in our model. So we take the following assumptions. In this case, we assume that the, the pulse duration is longer than the electrolyte diffusion time scale, so the electrolyte is at the steady state, that the ohmic losses in the electron and the electrolyte are smaller than this thermal potential, which is the, the, the scale where we expect to see variations, variations in, in the, the, the potential, that the open circuit potential is much larger than the thermal potential, and finally, that the change in stoichiometry over single pulse, so how much change in, in the stoichiometry or the state of charge we make over a pulse is small. So with all these assumptions, then we can perform these asymptotic analysis. And actually, we find out that the Webner and Huygens model is one of the outcomes we, we can get if we additionally assume that the, the particle diffusion time scale uh, is larger than the pulse duration. Uh, that assumption is very common in, in uh, all, all the literature when these types of models are used. And in fact, uh, that, that's what allows us to get this um, uh, equation or this expression for the variation in the concentration c minus c naught that behaves like a square root of time. That's where it comes from. But on the other hand, if we don't take that assumption, well, we can just um, have a very similar model, but now this variation in concentration, which here we call u, just for simplicity, comes from solving this uh, diffusion equation, this uh, diffusion equation in the particle. That's why it's, it's a single particle type model. And the interesting thing here is that note that the diffusion coefficient is evaluated at the C0, which is the initial concentration at the pulse, which means that the diffusion coefficient can depend, can change across pulses, but within a pulse, we take it to be constant. And that's why we're able to use this technique that uses linear diffusion even to estimate uh, variable diffusion coefficients. So with that in mind, let's see how these models perform. So what we do is generate some synthetic data by solving the DFN half cell uh, model. 
and then fit the two reduced models to the synthetic data to see what estimates of the diffusion coefficient we get. And because it's synthetic data, we know the actual value. In order to implement that, we use PyBAM, which is this Python-based uh, open source battery modeling package. And if you're interested in PyBAM, I suggest you check the, the talk by Robert Teams on, on PyBAM. So we have two models, but actually can consider different implementations of the model. And an implementation is basically how we go and take this model and fit it to the experimental data. So for the SPM model, we can just fit uh, in a given pulse all the data sets, so both the discharge part and the rest part, fit only the discharge or charge part, or only the rest part. Whereas for Weber and Higgins, we consider two implementations here. One is just fit, uh, here we can only work with the discharge or charge part of, of the uh, of the data. So we can just fit a square root of time profile, taking all those points in that transient, or we can use this four point method, which is presented by in the Weber and Higgins paper, which takes only uh, four points at the beginning and at the end of, of the polls uh, and to estimate it. And what we see when we compare here, basically we compare all of them um, and the dashed line represents the actual or the true diffusion coefficient for the synthetic data. And what we can see is that uh, no matter the implementation, the SPM performs better than the Weber and Huggins uh, model. In fact, we tried for different diffusion coefficients and what we find here is that uh, for larger diffusion coefficients, well, the models perform worse and worse. That was expected for the Webner and Higgins because uh, up here, when it's 10, the diffusion coefficient is 10 to minus 13, that extra assumption on the diffusive time scale is no longer satisfied, so we expected it not to work. For the SPM, the reason why it doesn't work is because the, the transient effects because of diffusion in the particles are comparable to the, uh, um, the time scale of the diffusion in the electrolyte, and therefore we get some mixed up effects, and that's why the estimation is not so good. And we also tested it with noise. So we had some noise, to the synthetic data. And what we find is that, of course, uh, the more data we fit, the more robust the, the method is. So of course, SVM full does better than the pulse of the rest. And as we already knew, because we, we, we had experienced that in, in our previous work, well, the four point uh, method is not very robust. So if we use the webmark Higgins model, we actually want to use the square root uh, approach. So that was the synthetic data, but of course we want to compare it with experimental data as well. And what we do here is feed the models uh, and the different implementations to uh, experiment the data on a half cell using an NMC, NMC811 uh, uh, positive electrode from an LGM50 cell. And what we observe first is that uh, the difference between the different implementations of SPM become more notable. So uh, in fact, using SPM full is even strongly more strongly recommended because it captures uh, defects both during discharge and relaxation, which is what we want to do. We want to capture everything. And on the other hand, we expect, we see that here, um, maybe that's unexpected, that the SPM full and the webinar Higgins square root perform very similarly. Uh, that's probably caused because we are on the low, lower um, range of the diffusion coefficients, so it's 10 to the minus 15 and, and lower. And therefore, here we would expect the two models to perform very similarly. So that's interesting. And despite they perform very similarly, we still recommend using the SPM full because it's, it's more general. And one of the main challenges here is how to calculate the derivative of the OCV, uh, because that can be quite noisy. In fact, that's why the four point method is noisy because it just uses finite differences. What we do here is for the other methods is fit uh, a spline to the OCV and then take the derivative of that spline as the derivative of our OCV. So to conclude, what we have, what we've seen is that uh, it's very important that the full model we use in our simulations and the reduced model we use in our uh, fits are consistent. And in order to achieve that, what we did is take the DFN half cell model, use asymptotic techniques to reduce it. And we found uh, both an SPM type model and a Weber and Higgins model. But for the latter, we need to take extra assumptions. So actually, we would suggest using the SPM model because it's more general. And that's supported by the comparison with both synthetic data and experimental data because the SPM tends to give better results than the, the Weber and Higgins for, for any implementation. In terms of future work, we want to apply these methods to fit other parameters, such as the reaction rates. And we also want to extend these methods to fit more complex models, such as phase transition models and also multiparticle models. Remember that you can submit your questions via these platforms. And thank you very much for watching.